Rub up your engines! Well, if you remember back a while ago, the Chevy electric car, they told you not to charge them fully, was recalled for having battery fires, and they set up so they can only charge a certain percentage. Had the same problem with his Teslas, and they changed the software so it can only charge them up to like 85 or 90 percent, so that the extra part, when they finally finish charging them, they don't overheat and start on fire. They haven't said exactly what the problem is, but they've now come to the conclusion that it is probably the separator inside the battery. There's anodes on one side, cathodes on the other, and in the middle is a separator. And it turns out that they create dendrites, which are little spiky things. And what they do is, as they grow inside that medium, they get spiky and they start to short things up. Now, they can have all the software they want, but that's not going to solve the underlying problem that these things are creating little growing crystal dendrites inside that eventually short the batteries out. It's going to ruin the batteries too. It's going to shorten their lifespan. So, this whole idea that oh, these lithium ion batteries are fantastic for cars. We see how many years they're out and how these things are going to start going out when you're using nothing but pure electric power. You take the Prius hybrids, well, they've got tiny little batteries compared to the full electric cars, and they're not running just electric cars. Hybrid of part gasoline, mainly gasoline. The electric's more of a boost to get range boosts and stuff, but the electric cars, that's the only thing they're using, so their batteries are getting much more strain than the smaller ones in the Prius. I've seen Prius batteries last 10, 15 years. My theory on this is there's no way you're going to be seeing these full electric cars with batteries that work at full power 10 to 15 years. They're going to be shorting themselves out, and that's the problem. Lithium-ion batteries, they can talk all they want about how great they are, but me, hey, in my own cameras, I use lithium-ion batteries. Little tiny Panasonic cameras, you know, they're this big, and even then, the batteries, I'm lucky if I get two or three years out of them before they crap out and I have to go buy another one, which I don't care that much. They're like 50 bucks a piece. But if they were, you know, fifteen to eighty thousand dollars a piece for the batteries, I'd be kind of concerned about it. And then again, I'm not riding on my camera; it's just taking pictures. <laughs> Well, if you own a Subaru, you might be interested in this. It might be a good reason not to buy a Subaru. There is a class action lawsuit for sudden acceleration. Now, it's been going on for a little while, but just the other day, 65-year-old woman in a 2017 Subaru Forester said it accelerated and wouldn't stop after she left the car wash. Then she said it went through backyards, ran through fences, and then it hit somebody's garage and stopped. Now, of course, Subaru tried to blame it on the woman hitting the gas instead of the brake pedal. They actually do have a class action lawsuit that the woman didn't know about at the time, so she's joined class action lawsuit now. No one, of course, knows what it is, except maybe it's the computer, maybe it's the automatic throttle, you know, modern cars, you step on your gas pedal. There's no cable that opens the throttle on the engine, it's just electronic. It's like a computer mouse that tells the computer, the computer tells the electric throttle to open or close, right? It makes sense to me that there's something wrong with that system or the computer, because she just got out of a car wash where everything gets sprayed and wet. Super of America, because now in a class action lawsuit, this is the second one, over sudden unintended acceleration for 2012 to 18 Foresters, 2015 to 19 Outback Wagon, and the 2015 to 19 Subaru Legacy Sedan. So you can join a class action suit, or if you do have a problem, by all means, contact the National Highway Traffic Safety Association. All you have to do is go to their website and you file a complaint. The way cars get recalled is when you out there have a problem, you go to that site and you file a complaint. And when they get thousands of complaints, guess what? Then the government looks into it, and they'll often lead to a recall. But if you sit on your fanny and don't complain to them, no one's going to know. Anytime you got problems with your cars like that, hey, complain. There's enough complaints, they look into it, and you might get a recall and have your car fixed for free. That's how it works. So get involved in the process if you have problems with any late model car that you own. D. Furchin says, My brother looking for a newer Toyota Sienna. I wanted to know if it's safe to buy the 17 with the 8 speed versus the 2016 with the older 6 speed. You know, the thing is, Toyota does make good transmissions. Some originally they whined about the 8 speed, said that doesn't shift perfectly. They fixed most of it with software updates, and they were a little bit off sometimes. 
times. It was nothing outrageous, but people are so used to perfections and Toyotas. But on the other hand, the 2016 six speed, that is proven technology. My son owns a Sienna with that six speed and it's bulletproof. It runs and runs and runs, right? I personally would like simpler technology. You get a tiny bit better gas mileage with the eight speed, yes, but who knows if it'll last as long because the six speeds pretty much lasted forever. So I personally would go for the six speed myself. Who knows? As time goes on, the eight speeds might prove that they last just as long, but I'm cheap and I know old stuff that worked. I'd rather stick with it to save a few pennies on gasoline. I'd rather have a car that would go three, 400,000 miles. That's the way I am. The only good guy says, I got a question. What kind of car should we get? Our lease is over and not touching it because we hated the Fiat Chryslers. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have a family of four. We don't know if we need a compact SUV, midsize, etc. Really, if you want to save money, get something like a Camry, a four door Camry. You can fit a family in easily. No problem for a family of four. There's lots of room in there. Everybody today has got the hots for SUVs and crossovers, right? You're going to pay through the news for those things because they're popular. You get a four door sedan like a Camry, comfortable to drive, it's going to last hundreds of thousands of miles, and you're going to get a much better price than an SUV or crossover because everybody wants them. Sedans aren't as popular as they used to be, so take advantage of it and buy one. They can last a lot longer and you're going to pay a lot less, plus they get better gas mileage. I got brand new Lexuses and Toyotas I tried out. I was amazed that the gas mileage wasn't that good on the highway because their SUVs are high up near, especially if you get a four-wheel drive one like the one I was testing out. You get a sedan, you're going to get a lot better gas mileage too. Check this out. Norway. You see all these big giant electric trucks hogging the fast charging station with a couple tiny cars around them. <laughs> That's something people aren't really thinking about, you know? If they do make it such that there's a whole bunch of electric cars out there, one, there's not enough charging stations, and two, you're going to compete with the giant trucks because, of course, the giant trucks will, as far as I'm concerned, much faster in volume than cars because commercially you can do things like have your own charging stations or you have professional drivers. But to give you an example in Norway here, the Volvo FE Electric, that thing can store up to 300 kilowatt hours. Well, fully charged. It takes one and a half hours at one of these fast stations. So if you're behind one, you're gonna be waiting well, one and a half hours till they're done. And if it's a low power charge, it takes 10 hours to charge them up. And when you look at it, the range isn't that much. The range is only 124 miles max with one of these things. So realize they're gonna be charging up all the time. So don't be surprised if you're waiting behind a giant truck for quite some time <laughs> to charge your electric cars. You're gonna be competing with the big boys there because it's not like you're not going to a truck diesel station. The trucks won't be using diesel. They use the same electricity as an electric car if you own one. So think about that if you're thinking about buying an electric car. Kaizen says, for your average daily driver, is there any significant difference between a four bolt hub versus a five or is it more of a prestige factor? All things being equal, which one's better than the other? All right. Well, you know, they all hold them on perfectly fine. It's just there's more bolts with the five. So the five is a safety. You've got extra safety if one of them broke, you know, but even with a four, if one of them broke it, it's still hold on with three. It's just, of course, cheaper to make a four. So if you got a lightweight car, they'll put four bolts on. If you got a heavy one, they put five. Some big giant ones will have eight or ten big old trucks. So the more weight you're carrying, the more bolts you should have. So you'd share the weight of the vehicle, especially when you're accelerating fast with more bolts. So each bolt has less of a strain on it. That's all it comes to. It doesn't really matter four or five. As you're making a race car, the more the merrier with that. You don't want to snap them up. For normal drivers, it really doesn't matter. The National Highway Traffic Safety Association is forcing Tesla to recall 133,951 cars because they've concluded they will inevitably fail. Yes, fail. Remember they always had that problem with their software. They could only write and rewrite so many times then it failed. It also do with the media control unit. It can only write and rewrite so many times and then it's going to fail. And of course, Tesla fought it to the nail, but the National Highway Traffic Safety Association said, no, they're going to fail. You got to fix them all. Now, of course, cars have failure points, but this is a notable one because this design makes it an eventuality that all of these cars will fail. Now, most car makers recall them voluntarily before they forced to, but, uh, you know, Tesla, uh, here we have a unique company. Now, they're just going to fight it tooth and nail until they're forced to recall the thing. Just shows the overall philosophy of the entire company. Big reason I tell people I wouldn't buy one if I were you. The lag time of getting them fixed. I've known people with them. It took them months to get their cars fixed, and there's a waiting line of people getting them fixed. There aren't that many places that actually fix them, of course, and they don't give the information out to regular mechanics. Take me. I'm a professional mechanic. I have a very 
good data system. I pay to use all data information. It's the best car information repair for North America. Just the other day for giggles, I thought, okay, I'll look up Tesla. Guess what? Tesla's not in the database because they won't share that information with all data. Everybody else does, even Porsche and BMW do, but not Tesla. They don't share their information. Now, the Nissan Leaf, another electric car, they had information shared on my all data, but not Tesla. So it just tells you. Big reason to stay away from them. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.